السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام. How are you? الحمد لله. الحمد لله الله يبارك فيكم. So, Dr. Thaer Ahmed, الحمد لله. We have been obviously following your work um, from Gaza. Uh, you are Palestinian American from Chicago, ER doctor. الحمد لله. You've been to Gaza multiple times with Med Global. First of all, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for mm-hmm. answering the call. Uh, to go there multiple times and to work there. May Allah Azza reward you for your efforts. May Allah Subhanahu accept all of the healing that you brought and all of the awareness that you brought as well and uh, keep you under his protection. Allahumma I mean, um, walk me through, you get a phone call that gives you an opportunity to go to Gaza in the middle of a genocide. How do you kind of process that on an emotional, spiritual, mental level? Well, I, I mean, I think from our perspective, all of us here, we're thinking about what can we do? And we've been thinking about that since October. And so we were looking into how can we get in? You know, SubhanAllah, there was a actual planned trip to Gaza October 22nd. But of course, after October 7th, it just got totally scrapped. Nobody was getting into Gaza. None of these organizations that usually bring in delegations or teams for anything were getting in. And we heard at the end of December, at the end of December, that there might be a chance that we could get in. and. Uh, I remember texting uh, Dr. Zahir, who's the founder of MedGlobal, and I said, if there's any chance, I'm going to be on that trip. And uh, he said, of course, he understood just how you know, emotional everybody was with respect to this and that we needed to feel like we were doing something. Um, so it, was, it wasn't really a tough decision. I think most of us would seize the opportunity to kind of show up. And subhanAllah, I just have the opportunity to be able to go into Gaza as a physician. And that's what they needed at that time. But of course, as you know, things move along and there's more requirements, I'm sure everybody will feel the same way. Everybody's going to want to step up. And I think that's, I always say this, but I think Gaza changed all of us. Gaza let us realize the na'ma and the barakah that we're living in. I mean, just being able to wake up in your bed every single day, you think about the fact that people who look like us, who talk like us, that they're not able to do so. I'm able to jump in the shower. I think we think about that a lot more now, given what's happened in Gaza and um, for me, that's that's really all that factored into the decision. I felt that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this opportunity to be comfortable here and that our voice can maybe be amplified. And what better way than to go there, bear witness to what's going on. And then if I'm lucky enough to be able to get out, to share that with everybody that wants to know what's happening on the ground. When was the last time you've been to Gaza prior to this one? It was in March prior to October. Yeah, it was in March. I was at Shifa Hospital. I know the Shabab there very well. Great people that I talk to regularly. They're so thirsty for knowledge. They're always asking, you know, what else can they learn? What else can they use? And so very, very good relationship with them. And uh, I, you know, ever since I had met them probably two years ago, I made it a habit to try to consistently go back. Alhamdulillah. So when October hit, like I'm sure like a lot of those images of the things you'd already seen in Gaza were fresh, right? And you were thinking about this. Can you kind of talk to us about that? Like when the bombing started in October? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really tough because Gaza is beautiful. I mean, it's amazing. The coastline is incredible. I mean, the scenery there is amazing. It's a tough place to live. I mean, there's make no mistake about it, right? I mean, there's a siege that's been there for 17 years. Uh, but the people, the life, you know, they call it the haraka, the, the movement that's there, it's, it's enchanting, it's, you know, mesmerizing. People are incredible to be around. And when you just watch that place get leveled the way that it was since October, every single day a new block is being taken out, a new block is being destroyed, um, you start to think about, you know, these beautiful areas that are, that's, that's gone, the memories of the people that are there. You know, I, one of the people that I had met, she had recently told me she's the um, she's a country representative for Met Global. So she's been on the ground, and she said, "All that we have left is our misery. Like even our memories, they've tried to destroy that by taking away the structures that were there. You know, just being on the beach, uh, being able to look at the Mediterranean coast. Now that area has become a death zone. You can't even walk up and down the beach anymore. And you know, it's really tough because it takes so long." to build up the infrastructure in Gaza because of the siege. 
because of the blockade. And to just watch it be reduced to rubble within seconds by 2,000 pound bombs, it's a struggle. I mean, you know, you really, you feel, you feel helpless in that moment. You're trying to think, you know, what are we supposed to do now? How do we pick it back up? And then instead of being able to focus on that, it's another devastating destruction somewhere. It's another block that's taken out. Is there anyone that passed away early on before you got back? Yeah. I uh, knew a couple of the doctors, actually. You know, there's been um, 400 doctors that have been killed, 400 healthcare workers since this started. And there was one particular guy who attended one of the sessions where I did a training for. You know, we got this uh, portable ultrasound machine. So you can just plug it into a phone, into an iPad. And I remember the doctors in Gaza were, they were so excited about that. It's like, we're going to use this. We're going to, you know, be able to kind of implement this. And one of the doctors who attended the very first training sessions, and he would always text and check up on me. He would always say, you know, doctor, how are you doing, doctor? How's everything going? Um, I didn't even realize this until I went that he had died. And that's sort of the tragedy is I had showed up to a Nasser hospital and I had recognized some of the guys from Shifa. And this is a bizarre thing to do. But I started going through the pictures of the guys I had met before and asked if they were still alive, the other doctors. You know, and then you come up and you're like, you know, this person was a martyr, you know. And so um, that's kind of just how tragic things are in Gaza. And, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. And that's the other thing. I think many of us who have friends in Gaza or even family, it's bizarre. You're sending messages, you know, are you okay? And you're hoping that it gets delivered on WhatsApp. And then you're hoping that there's a response. And then after there's a response, you don't know what to say. Right, yeah. like, Allah you know, Allah yahfazkum, making du'a for them, trying to say, I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects you, but um, what else can I offer? You know, I think that it goes back to your first question. It's factored into why I felt like I, you know, I wanted to go, and I know everybody in the community feels the same way. Yeah, I think it's, subhanAllah, I mean, like that thing about, like, scrolling pictures and, like, is this person still alive? Is this person still alive? Like. Yeah. This genocide is unfolding on everyone's screen. And so when someone who's been reporting from the ground suddenly stops reporting for a few days, right. everyone's thinking, have they been martyred? And it almost like it takes me on a personal level to like Jannah, where right. people are asking about each other, right? Where you're kind of looking around like, hey, yeah, where's this person? Where's this person? Like in SubhanAllah, you wonder, you know, hopefully Allah gives us that opportunity yeah. to ask about these names and yeah. To go find these people in Jannah and to rejoice with them once again in the night time. That's the hope, right? That's the shahada part. That, yeah. that martyrdom. People who reduce Islam to a death cult don't understand that. We just believe in life in a way that they just cannot grasp. And the people of Gaza have that belief more than anything else. You kind of talk about that, like that concept of like, hey, we know we're going to die, but we know that there's something after death. Like, how did you kind of experience that for yourself and for other people when you yeah. were there? I mean, the first day that I showed up to Nasr Hospital, it reminds me of the very first patient that I had seen that had been killed. And it was somebody who had been injured in an airstrike, 22 year old, 23 year old. And he was brought in by his mom, his dad and his siblings. And I remember because um, I had just shown up, I had put my bags in the room. I was going to be sleeping at the hospital. And I remember because the, when we walk in, he had lost a pulse. And so they were doing CPR on this person. You know, they were doing chest compressions. Um, and he was on the floor of the emergency department. And I didn't recognize that his family was there to begin with. So I just kind of got on my knees. I was trying to help the doctor. His name is Dr. Majdi, very young, brilliant uh, physician. But subhanAllah, I mean, that was, you know, it, that was his time. And, you know, he met his maker. And I remember kind of being shocked that it had happened so quickly. First day, I mean, first five minutes. And Dr. Majdi gets up and he looks at the guy's father. And he said, you know, آخر كلامه, his last words were, أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَا اللَّهِ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ And then the dad said, which that's, was very overwhelming for me. But he looked at him and he said, Amana, Like, Amana, oh. that, those were his last words. Like, that was one of the most comforting things you could say to the father of a martyr, to the father of the shaheed, of the, his son who had just been killed. He said, Amana, promise me that you're telling the truth. He said those were his last words. He said, those were his last words, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah. And he turned around to his siblings and to his wife. And he said, you know, that was, let's, you know, like he was comforting them. And then they picked him up 
in the blanket that they brought him in from their house and they went to go bury their son. And, you know, right away you start realizing that um, the people in Gaza, the way that they've perceived everything, they look at that hardship is different because I'd have to be honest with myself. Could I, sustain, could I have that sort of patience in that moment on the emergency department floor looking at my son, you know, essentially die, pass away? Um, am I going to have that moment to reflect and be able to take comfort? You have to have that belief in the afterlife. I mean, you have to believe there's an akhirah. If you don't, you're not going to be comforted by that's your, your son's last words. And for me, it made me really start to think about, you know, all of what's been going on in Gaza, how people have been processing it. And I realized that when you have strong faith like that, when you have the iman like that, you get the resilience of Gaza. Because, you know, I think we've been a lot of, a lot of people have been around tragedy. They've had personal loss. They've been through their own struggles. And, you know, this is an entire community of people that it's dealing with an in what seems like an insurmountable struggle but how do they stay so resilient and the only answer is their faith and you get inspired by that in a moment of sorrow and tragedy something inside of you clicks i mean something inside of me was you know was coming alive when you're watching that and so it makes you want to do better makes you want to work harder makes you want to figure out solutions for things and i mean i'll never forget that moment so what is like the difference between you're an er doctor mm. an er in chicago an er in Gaza. yeah give me that contrast i mean i want you to i want to paint the picture for you a little bit you know i work at a trauma center in chicago a very busy place we've got all of the specialties we've got all of the tools all of the tricks are up our sleeve you know we've got private rooms we've got every single patient has a has a patient bed has a private room that they can stay in um in Gaza. It's huddled masses. Many people are on the floor. Imagine just a concrete floor, blood stained, muddy too, because you're walking back and forth. That's where people are, have to seek care. But I'll say one thing, and subhanAllah, this is, uh, this is, it's going to sound weird, but the respect for dignity in Gaza was, I've never seen anything like that in the United States. I was in Detroit, in Chicago. If somebody's belly was exposed in the process of us carrying them to a CT scanner or putting them on the floor, you, a nurse, a doctor was grabbing a sheet to cover them. You know, if there is an elderly person that comes in that's sick, a young person who's injured or has a, you know, has all these different tubes and lines inside of them, he's getting up off of the bed to give it to the elderly person. You know, I mean, um, uh, the grandma who was shot by a drone, paralyzed from the waist down, um, everybody's calling her mama, you know, even you're not related to her, but she's, she's mama. She's, you know, she's your mother. That's how they're all treating each other there. I mean, despite it literally being out of stock from any medication, any anesthetics, no space in the hospital at all. We're talking about 10,000 people were sheltering inside the hospital and outside the perimeter there. No space. There's still an incredible amount of protection of dignity and respect. I don't see that in the States. And I just feel like, you know, they deserve all of the tools that I have in Chicago. They deserve the nice, fancy private room, the clean CT scanner, to be able to have a private suite if they get, you know, they deserve that. Um, but subhanAllah, the situation right now is, it was, it was overwhelming for me. You know, I was, I think I was useless the first, the first day that I was there. And if it really wasn't for my colleagues, my Palestinian colleagues there, um, I think I would have been an additional burden on them. They had to show me the ropes. They had to hold my hand for the first day and just be like, this is what we do in this situation. This is what we do here. So I, I owe them everything for that. I would have done nothing if it wasn't for them. So tell me about your first, like, if you don't mind, if it's not getting too personal, but like your first, like, real faith realization when you were there, like Salah or yeah. something that clicked with you that maybe yeah. hadn't clicked before, like about Ibadah, a uh, connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah, you know, and uh, you know, I'm not trying to say anything about Muslims in the United States or Muslims anywhere else. I just want to kind of highlight and amplify our brothers and sisters in Gaza. But, you know, every single person there when it's time for Salah is praying. Every single person. And they're praying anywhere. You know, the, I remember in the ICU um, that the ICU doctor and one of his nurses stepped out into the hallway to pray dhuhr. You know, and they've got their sajada, they've got their carpet that they're laying down. 
nobody's missing Salah over there. In fact, they asked me um, one time, they said, you know, I noticed you're, they, you're combining prayers. And they're like, uh, you know, you're home now. So you don't need to combine your <laughs> prayers anymore, you know? And I said, well, yeah, but I'm still living out of a suitcase. You know, I was giving an excuse to make it easy on myself. And then th just to make me feel better, they were like, well, what about the nazih, the displaced person? Can he combine their prayers too, just to kind of make me feel better? So and so, I mean, that's, yeah, that's the thing is, uh, I remember because Salat al Jum'ah basically had to be canceled in Khan Yunus for a couple of weeks because of the intense campaign. I mean, they were literally targeting the masajid. You know, there was, they made sure that there was no masjid still standing. And I remember them talking about just wanting to have that Jum'ah back, to have Salat al-Jum'ah back, to be able to go. And you, you see videos. I mean, the second they got a chance to do so in Rafah, they did khutbah al-Jum'ah and they were able to have a, a khutbah and they were able to have a salah, even though they was on top of rubble. I mean, I think they take um, the deen, uh, not, I don't want to say they take it very seriously. I mean, I think it's just a part of their life. I mean, it's just part and parcel for what they do. They all are talking about when Ramadan comes. They're all talking about being able to go and make hajj. And for a place like Gaza, everybody wants to be able to make hajj. I mean, it's, you can barely get out to go to Egypt. You know, it's just incredible how it's a part of their vernacular. It's a part of their everyday life. They're talking about, you know, what's halal and what's haram. And uh, they look at it in a way where they, they want to do the best. And they're all like, you know, there's not a lot of pu putting down of each other either, which is incredible. There's not a lot of wagging their finger or condescension. It's, you know, everybody's, th that idea of brotherhood, I felt it there. You know, this, that truly, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you, it's like these guys believe that and they practice that, you know. The believers are brothers. The believers are brothers, yeah. If there was one story, one person who you feel like fundamentally changed you, like yeah. one incident or one person, what would you... What would you share with us? There's plenty of them, but there's one that I always mention because it really got me. I mean, it really corrected me in a way that, uh, you know, I needed that lesson. I needed that reminder. Uh, every single night at Nasser Hospital, the nurses from the ICU would knock on the door where I was sleeping. And they say, we're going to have dinner together. And you have to keep in mind, this is Gaza. So everybody's dependent on the meals that are being distributed. And it's really just a can of beans, uh, some tamir, some dates. And uh, you get a bottle of water and sometimes there's some bread. And so there's not a lot to go around, but they wanted to invite me to make sure that I had dinner with them. They said, we have to, you're a guest and we have to obviously, you know, um, treat the guest well. And we were sitting there and they're all combining their stuff and they would insist that I eat first and that I eat to, until I'm full. You know, they would not sit down until I ate till I was full. Uh, but I remember sitting and talking to a nurse whose house had been destroyed in Rafah. They had a farmland. It was him, his father, his brother, their families, their kids. And it just totally destroyed. And he lost his brother's family. Uh, and he actually was rescued from the rubble. And he was showing me a video of himself, kind of the rubble on his face and his kids. And he was trying to make a joke about it, just saying like, look, I look so, you know, look how disgruntled I look. I was so nervous, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got me out of this. Then he said this line to me. He said, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really was teaching us how to be better. He said, before the war, he said, I was complaining that I was only getting 60% of my salary. He said, before the war, I was complaining that I can only go from the north to the south. Before the war, I was saying, we don't have a lot of different restaurants. It's always the same food over and over again. Before the war, I was complaining about the water. And before the war, I was complaining about 12 hours of electricity because Gaza operates at an energy deficit. He said, after the war, I have 0% of my salary. He said, I've got no food, no water. He goes, I can't even go to the north of Gaza anymore. I can only stay in Khan Yunus and Rafah. And he goes, we have no electricity now. He goes, so the day that this war is over, every single day I'm going to say, alhamdulillah, I'm going to appreciate the barakah that I live in. I mean, this was in January. You know, I was, I was really stunned by that. I mean, that moved me so much that he twisted it in that direction where he realized this is an opportunity to better himself. You know, I think it's pretty easy, and I was doing this, to say, look how terrible it is, it's, it's terrible, this is so sad, so sad, oh, look, you know, woe is me kind of mentality. And he really just corrected it in that moment. I mean, I'll never forget that he just kind of had that position. Um, and, you know, he did it with grace, too, and humility. He's not sitting there lecturing anybody. He's just telling you, this is, my, this is what I'm going to start doing. And you're like, I want to be like that. So, um, yeah. so it really puts into perspective that 
it's not about the world around you. It's about how you see the world around you. Right. And if you have that gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then even an open air prison can seem like a paradise. Yes, ma'am. And even in the midst of a genocide, you can see mm -hmm. rays of hope and you can see a jannah that awaits you. Yes, should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose you as a martyr mm -hmm. in that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for our brothers and sisters and grant them victory. Allah I mean, I mean uh, before we get into the, the Biden thing, I just want to <laughs> mention one more thing. You're actually, subhanAllah, you're from uh, Chicago, particularly uh, Bridgeview, where uh, a little young Palestine. boy, little Palestine, yeah. and a little Palestinian boy Wadir. was murdered very early on. Yeah. Wadir Fayumi, rahimahullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for his, his family. Yeah, I mean. uh, was murdered just within a couple of weeks of everything yes, happening. Um, I remember attending that janazah and thinking to myself, like, man, I wish I could, I wish I could be in Gaza right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering, like, what were your emotions kind of being in a community where a young Palestinian boy was martyred yeah. for being a Palestinian? Yeah. And how that kind of factored into everything, if it did at all for you. I mean, we were reeling. I mean, I, you, you were there. You saw an entire community was, was grieving and it was across the United States. It wasn't just Bridgeview, right? I mean, everybody was mourning, uh, you know, a six-year-old. And it, w it really felt like, you know, for us as Palestinians, um, as Muslims too, it's like, you know, people don't think that we're human. It was like that whole dehumanization campaign. Like the fact that somebody could bring themselves to stab a six-year-old that many times. And I'm an ER doctor. We see stab wounds. I just, the thought of sort of that trauma and that pain, I couldn't shake it. Obviously, I'm a father as well. And you're just thinking that, you know, I don't think um, we're given that same sort of, uh, you know, that same sort of, I don't know, is it dignity by other people? And so it's from my perspective, I mean, it shook me in a way that made me realize that, no one's going to sort of help us or no one's going to give us, you know, uh, no one's going to extend their hand, especially in that moment. It seemed like the entire world was against Gaza. The entire world was against Palestinians. Um, and for me, it was, okay, we're going to have to do something ourselves. You know, we're going to, you know, that whole idea, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. It's like, you know, all we have is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, and you hear that all the time. Allah. You hear that in Gaza all the time. And so, and it's just... You know, I think something that came out of Wadir, murder, that tragedy was, you know, realizing that it was it was on us to sort of do this, not to look to anybody else for help, not to look for it to any other human being, just sort of, you know, be prepared for this long haul. There's going to be a struggle here. And, um, you know, it's still, I think it's still pretty shocking, but there's been so many incidents too that have kind of afterwards where you're just, you, we continue to grieve and we continue to mourn, but it's just more reminders about, uh, I think our status, I mean, I think about those kids in um, uh, in New Haven, or I think it was in Connecticut, the three Palestinian kids. Oh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. Raleigh, North Carolina. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. You're just like, this is the series of attempts. You're like, wow. You know, there's, there's a lot of people working against us, and there's a lot of people who want to paint us in a certain light. And um, I think it's on each and every one of us to kind of fight that and fight that in our own way. Right. Yeah, you sort of was on. Um, most punch have mercy. I'm going to make it easy mm -hmm. for my families. Obviously, they're from Asham and our three winners, but right. they were yeah. murdered. Yeah. And may Allah accept them as shuhada as well. Yeah. Subhanallah, it's been years. Yeah. And we move on, yeah. but the families don't move on. No. Right. Never. It's, it's something that I think is very important. Like, we're going to be coming up on a decade of that at some point very soon. You know, may Allah make it easy for, for them and for all of, for the mother of Wadir, um, the family of Wadir, the mothers, inspiring woman by the way subhanallah man like she went through a lot she's an inspiring woman wow. like i was really really shocked and and i think that's that idea of being nurtured in something different everything that you just said could be summarized in hasbunallah and amal wakil the first thing i heard from wadir's mom was hasbunallah and amal wakil wow. the first thing you hear from everyone in Gaza is hasbunallah and amal wakil amazing Ma yeah. uh, it's la ilaha illallah manifested in your deepest moment of tragedy right yeah. and they've been able to do that consistently and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us that tawfiq to be able to have I mean, the, same, the same type of orientation. I mean. So I'm going to come to sort of what got you in the headlines recently. <laughs> um, but it's important. And um, first of all, on behalf of, uh, I think many of us, Jazakallahu khaira. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for doing that. Thank you. Uh, I think a lot of us have probably visualized, uh, <laughs> you know, walking out on the president the way that you did. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've obviously been chanting in front of the White House. Uh, but not in the White House, right. um, yeah. you know, and, and um, just tell us about the meeting, man, maybe a little bit 
more than <laughs> what you shared. You've already been, mashallah, on CNN, yeah. CBS, and right. different things. But like, just tell us, like, how did you get invited? Yeah. When you got there, did you already have the intention? It seems like you already kind of planned yeah, it uh, was, the walk out. So yeah, walk us through it. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was uh, the week leading up to it really kind of solidified my decision. I mean, we get a, I, we get a phone call saying, you know, we want to make sure that this year we don't do this big Ramadan fest. And we want to do a working dinner with the President of the United States. And I was told that I would be the first person who would brief him about Gaza, who had actually been on the ground after October 7th. And there would be other medical professionals there and other Muslim leaders there. And I had already known how the broader Muslim community felt about engaging with the president at this time. I mean, it was clear, like, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to sort of tokenize ourselves. We don't want to put ourselves in a position where we're going to try to say something, but we're not listened to. And it just becomes like we're sort of whitewashing everything that's happened over six months. The photo op that was coming, right? You know, yeah, you exactly. And, you, you and Biden and then exactly. the tweet that. You know, right, that exactly. So, doctor yeah. from heroic, heroic <laughs> doctor from Gaza. Yeah, thank you for coming and sharing your experience and thank you for supporting me, you know, kind of thing. But um, we, you know, I, I definitely was very concerned and I'm still very concerned about Rafah um, having been there. 1.7 million people, intense. They're talking about a ground invasion. So that for me has been something that I've been panicking about over the past couple of weeks. And so I really wanted to do, get that message out there. Um, but then you heard about weapons approval, fighter jets being sold. You heard about um, undermining the UN Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire by saying, oh, it's not binding. I mean, everything that indicated that this meeting is not serious. I mean, I'm not gonna sit there and while literally all of the pain and suffering is going on, and there may be a catastrophic event that takes place with respect to Rafah, I'm not going to just sit there and, you know, um, sort of be played in kind of talking in Chicago terms. But I really, I, you know, I, I wanted to do something. I mean, I was so angry. I'm so resentful about everything that's been going on. And so we went to the White House and, you know, you kind of walk through and um, we wait in the room and they said, you know, the president should be arriving any moment. And then you just kind of see different members of his staff and it's the president and the vice president. He kind of walks around, sits down. And I remember, you know, he's saying, okay, well, you know, kind of let's get started. Um, you know, we've been working on this a lot. He said, and I said, you know, I just thought about what that meant actually, you know, working on this a lot with respect to Gaza. He said, um, this is a listening session. You know, I hope you guys can trust that we know a little bit about what's going on too. And I, you know, for me, I was, I could feel it building up. Like I got to stay calm. You just deliver the message that you want to deliver, that Rafah has to be off limits because of all of the human beings that are there. And that, you know, it's not just about stopping an invasion or a ceasefire. There needs to be some help for the people that are there with respect to water, to even blankets. How are they going to rebuild their homes again? Like that needs to be in the calculation here moving forward. We need to help the people in Gaza rebuild everything that was destroyed. And then finally, I wanted to give him a letter from Hadil, an eight-year-old orphan in Gaza, in Rafah, in a tent, who lost her family. She lost her uncles and her father. She's an orphan. And uh, I was like, I'm, I have to do this. I mean, if I have any respect for myself, um, I, gotta, I have to actually make this statement. I gotta, should get up and walk away. I'm not going to throw anything around. I'm not going to kick the chair. I'm not going to yell. You know, I just want the message to be clear. Like, I'm doing this because of the pain and the hurt, and I want you to feel that, I want you to see that. Um, and I knew that there would be people in the room that would also still be able to communicate the messages, you know, that, that, we, that we want to get out there. You know, the, the idea of the humanitarian crisis and the famine and the malnutrition. Um, so I, I, wanted, I just wanted people to feel like they got a chance to tell the president, like, we're not happy with this. We're going to walk away from you. We're walking away from this table. You need to do something. There needs to be concrete steps. Um, and alhamdulillah, I got that opportunity. And, um, you know, people ask me, um, were you nervous at all? And honestly, I was not. I, I, was, I was just, I'm not nervous because I'm not doing anything special. Really, I'm getting up and walking. Alhamdulillah, I have the ability to walk. I can walk outside of a door. Um, but for me, it's more about, can we use this moment to translate into change? If that happens, then I'll be incredibly happy. But until that, that, that's the case, you know, I think all of us are in that mode where, what, what's the next? What's the next step here? What can we do to bring some attention, to put some faces on the people that are there, and to get the massacres to stop? And I, I know everybody feels the same so, way. So let me ask you like a deeper question. Yeah. Did you feel like when you were speaking, you were getting through to anybody else in the room? Did you feel like, I mean, like you can read sentiments. Yeah. You're an emotionally intelligent like guy. Like you can probably feel like what's going on in the room, right? Who's right. 
Did you did you feel like staffers or like people are like kind of like, were you getting a sense like, man, like this is disgusting. Like we're doing this, right? You're literally, it's Kadi Mato Hakkar and the Sultan. Yeah, just you're speaking dead, yeah. it right in his face, right? And like you got a lot of people around him and we know like staffers and there's a lot going on in there, right? So yeah. did you feel like your message was actually getting across to anyone, like in making their stomachs churn a bit, maybe their hearts? I, I think they felt the tension. I mean, I think they felt also in my voice, the urgency. I mean, when we talk about Gaza now, we can, there's a there's the tone that's there. And I think people understood that. And you can't take away from the fact that we were on the ground and we saw this with our own eyes. I don't have an agenda. I'm not a part of, I'm not a registered participant in any political party. I'm not the president of any organization. I'm not selling anything that I need to make money off of to the president. I don't need a, his contracts. I'm just telling you based on what I saw. And you can feel how nervous I am about what's happening in Gaza right now. And I feel, and I'm gotten to the point where I'm concerned about this, you know, this, this invasion that may take place. And I do think that there were people who actually received that message. They understood. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, when we're, when you are just only focused on the truth, then, you know, what can you argue against me? Right. What can you push back in my face? And I, and the one thing I did mention, because I know that they've been meeting with their Israeli counterparts and they're saying that there is no famine and there is no malnutrition and that they are bringing aid into there. I said, I'm telling you firsthand and I can give you examples and details about how everything that they've said about this is not true. And whether you want pictures or you want people. I'm talking on behalf of thousands of starving children in Gaza Strip. We have been under brutal siege for 135 days. No food, no water, no medicine. Our message to the world, shame on you. How dare you food? your children while we eat animal food are you waiting our death shame on you our message towards leaders we don't ask you to fight israel we are asking for food there are plenty of people who can attest to this and i'm here now in this room so you know i think uh, you know i think i hope inshallah that that message does get through i think it was received by several people at the very minimum um, I think you, you ever have that sort of feeling when, um, you know, you're about to discipline someone. I'm not saying that I was going to discipline the president or, or the guy. I'm just saying you always, if you feel like maybe there's something wrong that happened, you have that feeling inside of you. And I do think some people felt like, yeah, something wrong did happen with respect to what's going on in Gaza. There are lots of areas where we fell short and we could have done, we could have made a difference in people's lives. So I do think that that message is loud and clear. Everybody's been saying it, and I think I was just kind of repeating that message, and I hope it soaks in. All right, last thing. American Muslims, courage. You learn courage and character and resilience and faith from the people of Gaza. By taking these types of steps in your career, you're risking your career. we got people that have been fired from hospitals over sharing an Instagram story, over a okay. tweet. We've got people that have lost their jobs at law firms. The doxing is crazy. Yeah. What's a message that you can give to American Muslims? about courage right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna go back to the people in Gaza and I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention two things from them, honestly, that um, stuck out to me. There's this level of honesty that's there that I didn't, haven't seen replicated anywhere else. Just this willingness to speak the truth, even if it's against themselves. And I'll give you an example. I was at Shuhada Al-Aqsa Hospital in Dir al-Balah and there was an ICU doctor there and he was one of five people that stayed in the hospital to treat the patients when the Israeli tanks started to surround the hospital and actually hit the ICU. And many people fled reasonably. I mean, like many people went to go take care of their families. They, they got out of there. But he was one of the people that decided to stay in the hospital. And as the Israeli tanks withdrew, many of the medical staff started to come back. And I remember them talking about it. And he asked one of the guys, I said, why did you leave? Why don't you stay with me? And the guy told him, he goes, I'm going to be very honest with you. I was terrified. I was scared. That's why I left. He goes, now I'm not scared. So that's why I came back. And that sort of honesty to me is like incredible. It was again, he was basically testifying against himself, but he's just willing to put it forward. I think that's something we have to think about. I mean, these people are willing to speak up the truth in the face of fighter jets, tanks, massive military. We should be able to at least say what we think is right and communicate in an effective way. My only message is think about how you're communicating it and messaging it. We want the person to respond to it because we know the truth is on our side. 
we know that we're speaking the truth. We're not lying. We're not propagandists. We're just trying to communicate about the suffering that's there. We want our people there to have the right to life, to be able to live freely and to live with dignity and to be able to do what they want without having to worry about being killed. Just think about how, you, how that message can be received. I know how my colleagues at work can receive it. It's going to be different than how the president receives it. You know within the community that you deal with how they're going to receive it, people who are also non-Muslim. Let's just get this story out there because we know we're speaking the truth. Exactly. Right. Yeah. bless you. And I do want to point out here, by the way, so how long, your wife and you got two kids under three. <laughs> May Allah bless you and your family. I mean, thank so, you. I think that um, when you take this type of a step, and, and I've said it and I mean it, I'm extremely proud of all of my friends who are doctors, brothers who have gone forth. SubhanAllah, there are over 20 people that I know right now in Gaza yeah. that are doctors. And it's Amazing. just like, we have a community here in Dallas. We were just talking about this. Like we've, we've sent more from Dallas probably than anywhere else. Amazing. I'm so indebted to each one of you guys, but also your families. Because your wives are at home, <laughs> you know, for the sisters that have gone, their husbands are at home. Yeah. Little kids yeah. sometimes and not knowing what's going to happen. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them as well, reward the mm-hmm. families and reward I mean, you all, inshallah ta'ala. Allow mm-hmm. this to be a means of bringing healing to our people in Gaza. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give victory to the oppressed everywhere mm-hmm. and allow us to be vehicles of conveying that truth. Allah mm-hmm. Allah mm-hmm. So jazakallah khayran. Once yeah, again, thank may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and accept Barakallah. Barakallah fiqh, Shaykh. Thank you.